I'll switch to English because it's time to introduce our uh, final keynote at uh, NCURL 2019. How can we prepare our children for a world run by software? How can we make uh, computers and coding relatable and understandable to them so that they are not scared but will want to take part in, in molding this future? Uh, questions such as these have been essential to much of what um, Linda Liukas has been working with. She's a programmer who's uh, also an author and illustrator, and she's got a very impressive list of accomplishments. Um, she's the co-founder of Rails Girls, a nonprofit teaching programming to young women in, I think, 270 cities across the world. But that list seems to be, or that number <laughs> seems to be increasing all the time. Yes. Um, her TED Talk, A Delightful Way to Teach Kids About Computers, has raked up nearly two million views. And she's now a sought-after speaker all over the world. Um, but she's perhaps best known for her charming books about a young girl <laughs> called Ruby mm. <laughs> and her adventures in the world of technology. Um, following her conviction that young children could learn the fundamentals of programming um, through books, Linda asked for $10,000 uh, of funding at, uh, through Kickstarter. Uh, how much did she get? Well, within 24 hours, she'd received $100,000. She ended up raising more than $380,000. Um, she's since published three books in the Hello Ruby series, but the fourth one is coming, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, right around the corner. And two of them have been uh, translated to Norwegian, with the third one coming soon as well. So you've perhaps seen them on, on sale here at Enkul. Uh, by, they're uh, published by InfoVest for Lug. Right, so uh, enough of me. Uh, today, Linda will be talking to us about um, her principles for, of play and her work building com uh, computer curriculum all around the world. Give a warm welcome to Linda Lucas. <laughs> energy in this room. It's so amazing and so, so delighted and happy to be here talking to all of you today. Uh, you know, I am actually a huge fan of Norwegian TV, not only SCAM, but Sangophony is the program I show to my, my godchildren. Uh, the quality and the, the attention to detail is exquisite, so I'm happy to get to meet a lot of teachers now from this wonderful country. So my name is Linda. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. I'm a pretty mediocre programmer. I'm a business school dropout, and you might be wondering what on earth is she being, uh, doing here talking to a bunch of teachers? Well, it turns out we humans like having many things in ourselves. We contain multitudes. Computers are binary. They can be one thing or the other, on or off, one or zero. But we humans can be many things at the same time, and I think this is going to be the future of many of our kids. This is where my career started from, from this idea that if code is the next universal language, if our kids are going to be practicing uh, Swedish, English, Chinese, JavaScript as their first foreign languages in school, instead of grammar classes, we ought to be teaching poetry lessons. And what I mean with that is the idea that we don't learn a language only by conjugating irregular verbs. We don't learn a language only by practicing the rules. We learn a language by using it, by singing in it, by writing bad poems in it, by flirting in it, by reading books in it. And even though code is not a natural language, I think the pedagogical depth and variety we need to show when teaching these skills should be much more diverse. So when I was practicing programming in my early 20s, I was really disappointed with the materials out there. Everything was really dull and grey and boring. I was practicing this programming language called Ruby. So every time I ran into something in the computer science books I didn't understand, like what is object-oriented programming or what is functional programming, I would try to imagine how a six-year-old girl would explain the concept. And that's how Ruby was born, literally in the margins of my computer science books. And something in my brain switched at that point, because I started to see the world of software through stories. 
And we live in this age where, like you've learned in the past three days, we have so many different ways to learn to code. Everything from the gamified puzzles of code.org to the open-ended playground of Scratch. But my big question, and the question that I try to fill in my career, is where do stories fit in this equation? Because in some ways, stories have always been the way we humans learn about ourselves. We learn about each other and we learn about the world around us. And no one was really bringing the storytelling aspect to the world of computer science. So today, the books have been published, as mentioned, in 26 languages, which is insane. And uh, I get to travel around the world, everywhere from the Arab Emirates to Japan, to the States, to here in Norway, speaking with teachers and parents alike, and helping together figure out how do we raise a fearless and curious and creative generation of children. And I'm really excited and happy that Ruby has found such a wonderful and warm home here in Norway, and I hope that many of you will buy the book and see the magic for yourselves. And even though I'm probably most known for knowing, uh, speaking about learning to code, actually what I think I'm doing right now is something much deeper. Because it's not only about the code. I wrote also a book about the computer hardware, how do computers work. I wrote about a book about how computers talk to each other, so what is the internet and what are computer networks. And the final book is about machine learning and AI and how computers are changing our societies. And through these four books, I'm trying to explore how do we explain these concepts for kids and also adults alike. And I'm also happy to announce that next fall there's going to be a YouTube series freely available for teachers everywhere around in the world called Love Letters to the Computer. And it's going to follow roughly the outline of the books as well. So we'll talk about computer science, we'll talk about computer networks, we'll talk about the hardware, and we'll talk about equity and diversity when it comes to computer science. And what I think I'm doing right now is actually preparing kids for a world where many of the problems around us are computer problems. Computer science has done the worst thing for itself by calling itself computer science. And let me explain why. When we think about a physicist, we think about someone who studies the physical world. When we think about a biologist, we think about someone who studies the biological world. So it's very natural that when the layman thinks about a computer scientist, they think about someone who studies the computer, often in a hoodie, smells kind of bad, is really obsessed with logic and math. But that's not true. A computer scientist is someone who uses the computer to study the big problems in the world, those of education, nutrition, health, energy, and also expresses themselves, just like you would with paint or poetry or um, guitar. And more and more of the big problems in our society have to do with humans and machines learning together. And this is not a new sentiment. Edgar Dijkstra is often um, attributed to this, science, uh, this quote that says, computer science is no more about computers than telescopes uh, are about astronomy. And that is true, because computer science is about thinking skills, about human skills, and the way we structure problems so that a computer can help us solve them. So meet Ruby. She's six years old, completely fearless, very imaginative and a little bit bossy. And when Ruby's dad tells Ruby, hey Ruby, we're running late from school, dress up really quickly. Ruby dresses up but she leaves her pajamas on because dad didn't specifically tell her to first take off the pajamas. And when Ruby is told, hey Ruby, your room is a mess, clean up all the toys. Ruby puts the Legos away and she puts the plush toys away, but she leaves the pens and papers on the floor because, come on, Dad, pens and papers are not really toys. <laughs> and there's a chance that I'm raising a very obnoxious generation of children. I apologize for that in advance. But they also learn something very profound about computer science, how you need to give exact commands in the right order. Naming things is really important. You need to take into account all kinds of situations that might arise for the computer. And then the most, most important thing that I would want every child who reads the book series to remember is that even the biggest problems in the world are just tiny problems stuck together. So with that in mind, 
I figured that I would try to give you the A, B and C of technology education for the future. And A obviously starts with the word algorithm. So I would suspect many of you in the room don't fear the word algorithm, but regular adults, regular parents, they feel a shiver of mistrust. They think of finance and Facebook. And that's why we start with something very simple. Uh, a lot of you probably do already these unplugged activities, where for instance one of the children is a computer, one of them is uh, a programmer, and the programmer's role is to teach the computer to brush your teeth by giving exact commands. And this uh, a lot of hilarity ensues, there's a lot of laughter, there's a lot of making mistakes, and through doing something like this we need to think a lot about uh, the principles and, and ideas of computer science, like do we know what a toothbrush is? How do we define a toothbrush? Uh, once we've gotten the toothbrush and once we've gotten uh, our hand to stop uh, in front of our face, we remember the toothpaste and we remember that the toothpaste has a cork and so forth and so forth. So the children, they learn that programming is not a lonely discipline. You work together with someone else and we even have a special word for that. It's called pair programming. When you have two pairs of eyes that recognize problems better than one pair. They learn that computer science is all about making mistakes and then fixing them. And we again have a special word for it. It's called debugging, when you go into your code and fix what's wrong. And finally they learn that coding is very creative. There's probably 10 or 15 different ways to solve the toothbrushing algorithm within a classroom. Often in math education, especially in the early years, we only give one right answer, wrong answer and right answer. Many wrong answers and one right answer. But in programming it's different. Some code is more elegant, of course, some code compiles faster, some code is easier to document, but as long as the code works, it's correct. So anyone here who has ever done a cupcake, you've followed the power of an algorithm. Because instead of doing one cupcake, you can also do a hundred million cupcakes. Anyone here who has given instructions to a friend to find from place A to place B, you've also followed an algorithm. And this is the power of an algorithm. Once you break down a problem into small pieces, you can repeat it over and over again without the computer ever feeling tired. But this is not the algorithm most of you think about when you think about the word algorithm. We think about math. And that's why with the kids I also show them numbers. I show them these five numbers and I tell them, please put these numbers in order of magnitude, starting from the smallest ending to the biggest. And the kids take roughly a minute, two minutes to complete this task. And then I ask them to do the same with these ones, and then the same with these ones. And at this point the kids complain, this is going to take forever. And I tell them, you just learned a really valuable lesson, never compete with a computer on a task like this. <laughs> Computers are always is going to be faster, they don't make nearly as many mistakes as, as humans, but they still need instructions. And that's called an algorithm. And a way a computer might solve this problem is like this. It would start from the beginning, it would compare 1 and 56, it would say 56 is bigger than 1, let's keep it like this. It would move to 56 and 4, it would say 4 is smaller than 56, let's swap this around. It would move then to 56 and 70, says it looks okay, 70 and 20, let's swap these around. And then it would move all the way to the beginning and repeat this loop over and over and over over again until the numbers were in order. This is called a bubble sort algorithm, a really famous algorithm written sometime in the 70s, still a workhorse uh, of the internet, powers a lot of the stuff we do online, and it was written by a human. It was not magic. But this still is not the algorithm we fear when we wake up in the night and think the word algorithm and feel a shiver of fear. Uh, I show children a picture of a search engine and I ask them, where is the algorithm hiding? And the kids say, hmm, maybe the search results. And I say, yes, the order in which your search results, that's defined by an algorithm whose sole job is to find the relevant content for you. And also the ads on the right hand side and uh, up there, those are defined by an algorithm. Someone has taken into account your search history, your location, it's trying to make a guess of your gender, and written instructions on what kind of ads you should be shown. 
What about a social networking site? Again, the ads, it's not a coincidence that Facebook knows to show you the exact address you were browsing earlier on in an online shop. But also the order in which your updates are shown and whose updates you see. Because see, there's an algorithm that maximizes the amount of time you're spending on the site. So it tries to make a guess and the biggest guess it can make is people whose profile you visit often are important to you. Let's show those people uh, for you first. And then finally, what about YouTube? Where is the algorithm hiding? Well, in the kinds of uh, ads you're shown, in the predictive text thing, when you type something in and YouTube suggests what you might be looking for. But more and more, also in the kinds of videos our children see. Because you see, there's 400 hours of new video content uploaded to YouTube every one minute. So there's no way a human can go through all of that content. So we need an algorithm. And turns out, algorithms favor a certain type of weird content. These surprise Play-Doh ex Peppa Pig Stamper Cat unboxing toy videos that have nothing to do with the beautiful quality video content that NRK or Sangophony presents. They are mismatched weird uh, algorithm-driven uh, videos that are not suitable for our children. And these are the algorithms I fear, when the content is being developed for the machine, not for the human. But we don't want to end the kids in a bad state of mind, so then we built a cardboard YouTube. It can look fancy like this, I'll show you another version in a second. And we start by a very traditional English language learning activity. Uh, they need to make their own YouTube video and they choose first what kind of a video they are about to make and then they break their video into the beginning, the middle, the end, all stuff that you, the kids in elementary school anyways practice in uh, their mother's tongue, tongue classes. And then we get into the interesting phase. We start to perform the videos. And these kids are English as second language learners. They had just moved from Japan and they were never the center of attention in the classroom. And in this uh, little segment, like the little girl had seen a heart origami video. And she was really, really excited about that video. And she made the boys do the heart origami paper while she was narrating the video. And once the video was over, I asked the kids to show first thumbs up, because that's what you do on YouTube, you give thumbs up to people. And then I said, let's hear some comments. And then the kids would shout, epic, would subscribe, more of this, awesome. And I saw how the little kids, they beamed, because they had never been the center of attention in this kind of a way. And I promise you that by the time we had finished this activity, when we had talked about a good time and a good description and tags and we had started to talk about how the algorithm chooses what kind of videos to show and how it looks for the likes and the subscriptions and the examples and all this stuff. The children will never forget this because the algorithm word is grounded into a memory and is grounded into a feeling and that's what we, I think we should be doing with computer science. So none of this is really new for all of you, because as pedagogists you know that you can't offer an entirely organized intellectual discipline for children only by giving them pre-organized vocabularies and concepts. That true learning is grounded in action. And so often when we talk about computer science, we talk about something very abstract. So as a community, I think we should bring the abstraction level down and make it tangible and make it real. And in this, I think we should look for the Danes, because in some ways, uh, Lego has been doing this very, very world-class pioneering work around the ideas of play, and this is one of my favorite charts from them. They map the different motivations of play, and they say that there's achievement-based motivation for a play, social motivation for play, and immersion motivation for a play. But for some reason, whenever we talk about programming, we end up only using this achievement side. We talk about points gamification, numbers, challenging others, provocation, domination. But all of you who program know that there's so much more in programming. There's finding and giving support to one another, there's collaboration, there's storyline, there's exploration, there's the joy of finding a new way of solving a problem, and at least for me, avoiding real life problems of the time. <laughs> And I think we should be teaching with all these different aspects of play when we're introducing programming for the early childhood learners. 
and it requires us to ask questions we are not very used to asking, like how does a loop feel? A computer scientist might ask, please define to me what a loop is. A primary school teacher or even a high school teacher or a pedagogist might ask, how does a loop feel? So in Ruby's world, we, for instance, practice a dance movement loop party where Ruby's favorite dance movement is clap, clap, stomp, stomp, clap, clap, and jump. Oh, wow, I'm not going to jump on this <laughs> too much. And uh, we practice a four loop by repeating this loop, say, five times. So you have a loop that has... Um, where you repeat the sequence of movements uh, a certain time. And then we practice a while loop by dancing while a condition is met. So while I'm standing on one leg, keep dancing. And then as homework, they get the until loop, which is where you keep repeating the sequence until a condition is met. So until mom gets really, really frustrated, they keep dancing. <laughs> And in this way, I'm hoping that they have this very kinetic experience. Then they might go into Scratch or another visual programming language. Then they might try the syntax in code. And very importantly, we ought to give the practice and the context of learning. Why am I learning this loop thing? So if you want to make a game, you can make a hero that says, keep moving the hero until it hits the enemy. And these abstractions of computing are brand new. No one has really figured out how to do these things. And we have a few words, but I feel like they are still kind of messy and flimsy and don't really grasp the full potential of computer science. One of these words is computational thinking that helps, I think, a lot of people who feel frightened about the word computer science get started. Um, and it includes concepts like algorithms, decomposition, pattern recognition, but then very importantly also practices, those of persistence, collaboration, creativity, tinkering. And I think this helps a lot of beginners to recognize that even though you would be the world's best at teaching algorithms, unless you have the persistence, unless you teach the persistence, the kids are not going to get very far. So it's teaching both the concepts and the practices. And this brings us to B, which is Boolean logic. And it starts from the idea of a computer. Because you see, I obviously love computers, but I also think they're very foreign to me. I'm somewhat jealous for the people who, who here grew up in the 1970s when you could still touch a transistor. You could take apart a computer and touch a transistor radio. For my generation, we can jam 300 million transistors at the pinpoint of a pen. But there's no way of understanding how computers work anymore. They are sealed boxes of mystery. And sometimes I wish I could shrink myself to the size of a silicone chip. Unfortunately, that's not possible unless you're a children book author. <laughs> so that's exactly what I did with Ruby. One day Ruby's really bored, she goes into dad's office and she types her password in, but the computer doesn't work. And all of a sudden, the white mouse wakes up next to Ruby and says, Ruby, I've lost the cursor. Please help me find the cursor. And Ruby says, oh, of course, I'm the best computer debugger I know of. And they make themselves really, really small and they fall together, just like in Alice in Wonderland, deep, deep, deep deep inside of the computer to the layer of electricity, where there's billions of tiny switches that only know how to go on and off, on and off. They either pass electricity or they don't pass electricity. They are the ones and zeros, the bits. And we could find the cursor here, but it would take forever. So Ruby says, let's climb higher. And they meet the logic gates that are tiny mathematical operators that take these tiny bits. And they do more complex things with them, but still at the level of first grade math. And Ruby says, no cursor here, let's climb higher. And they meet the CPU of the computer, the processor who's really good at bossing everyone else around, fetch, execute, store, but really forgetful. So it needs help from the RAM and the ROM and the hard drive. <laughs> And it meet, she meets the operating system and they do finally find the cursor. I'm not going to spoil you how you'll need to read the book for that. But I think more importantly, they get this very uh, robust idea of how electricity turns into logic. How logic turns into hardware, how hardware turns into software, and how software turns into the apps, programs and games we use on a daily basis. And this is important, because I don't want a generation of kids who don't have a mental model of how computers work. And that's why I sometimes ask them to draw what is inside a computer, not anticipating the perfect result, just asking them to have a beginning point in their queries. 
So for instance, I've had kids who draw that there's apps and games inside of a computer. This is true. I've had kids who make these really abstract interconnected components, the future computer architects maybe, the linkers. I've had kids who draw these really elaborate stories around what happens inside of a computer. I've had kids who even imagine that there's tiny gears inside of a computer. And I've had kids who imagine the resistors and transistors and the motherboard. And all of these kids, they build a foundation upon which they can build more knowledge. And they understand that a computer can take a thousand faces and a thousand forms. And most importantly, they learn that while computers are magical, they are not made of magic. While computers are magical, they are not made of magic. They are made of logic. And it's a huge difference. So finally, why is this important? Why should we learn about computers, not only coding? Because this is the last generation of children that will remember the computer defined by a screen, a keyboard and a mouse. Already the next generation, they are speaking to a computer. And when I show them these four pictures, a car, a grocery store, a dog and a toilet, and I ask which one of these is a computer, the kids already know. They know that a car has a navigation system, so it's a computer. Grocery stores have so many different computers, starting from the sensors that open the doors when you go in, to the cashier's machine, to the uh, burglar alarms. Dogs are not computers, but a dog might have a microchip under its skin, so if it runs away, you can find it. And then I tell the kids that here in Scandinavia, toilets are not computers, they are still mechanical, but in Japan, you can uh, program almost <laughs> a computer, uh, a toilet, you can change the heating of the rim and like play different sounds, and there's even hackers who hack the toilets, which is like the biggest mic drop moment with the children, nothing else gets discussed after this. <laughs> So very importantly, the children learn that there's hundreds of computers already in every home. And then I give them these little tiny stickers with an on-off button on them. And I've collected these everyday objects like a tuna can, like keyboard, uh, like keys, like a book. And I tell them that for this afternoon alone, you can make anything in this room into a computer by putting this little sticker on it. And I have a little girl who comes to me. She's chosen a bicycle lamp. And she tells me, Linda, if this bicycle lamp was a computer, I could go on a biking trip with my father. We could sleep in a tent. And this bicycle lamp, it could also be a movie projector. <laughs> and that's the moment I'm looking for. Not the moment when the kid understands the differences between hashes and arrays or different data structures or learns to write an if-else statement in JavaScript. The moment when they understand that the world is not ready yet. There's so much we haven't invented yet. Technology is a wonderful way to make the world a little bit more ready. And then finally, that she herself can be a part of that change. For a moment, she had the self-efficacy, self-agency and self-belief to believe that she could be the world's first computer um, a bicycle lamp movie projector innovator. And I think that's the most important role an educator can play. Safeguard that sense of possibility in children. So how do we explain what a computer does if we can't recognize it based on the screen or the keyboard or the mouse? It's curious that in order to understand the future of technology, we need to look into the past. And we need to go all the way back to year 1945, when John von Neumann was designing his von Neumann architecture of a computer. And a little bit simplified, what von Neumann says is that a computer is any device that takes in data, processes that data somehow, and out comes the modified data. And there's stored memory that stores uh, the data. And then uh, there's um, memory where you write the instructions on what to do with that data. And this is true when you go on Facebook, you like a post, in goes the information to Facebook server that someone has liked this post, out comes the updated like count. But this is also true when you sit in a car and you forget to buckle your seat belt, in goes the sensory information that someone is sitting here and the seat belt is unbuckled, out comes the beep, beep, beep noise we hate so much. And the world is full of these input process output systems because we have input devices like the mouse and the keyboard and sensors and microphones and output devices like the 3D printer and, and the touch screen and the monitor. 
And at this point, kids are already a little bit bored. So we build a gigantic input-output machine, and the kids crawl inside of the machine. There's a tiny piece of text saying, for instance, come out jumping on one leg, and then they become the input data, they experience the process, and then they become the output data. And around and around and around they go, until this machine usually breaks pretty quickly. <laughs> Maybe, 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 maybe your most important job as an, uh, as an educator is not to teach the kids coding. Maybe the most important thing you can give to the children is the concept of a notional machine. The idea that we should teach our kids to understand what a computer is good at and what a human is good at. To give them a robust mental model of a computer. And that brings us to the final topic of today, which is C, and which stands for creativity and computers. And it starts with the idea of AI and machine learning. I don't know if it's the same thing, I, I'd imagine the same thing is happening in Norway, where every single TV channel, every single newspaper for the past few years has been doing this fear-mongering around AI, saying that AI will destroy our jobs, and machine learning has made huge breakthroughs, which means that we humans will be redundant. And it almost feels like we're raising this medieval monster out of nothing, and as parents and adults we think that, oh, it's the Terminator, oh, it's the sky in it. And last year I had a little boy come to me and say, Linda, what am I going to do when the robot takes all the jobs out there? And I say, oh my goodness. <laughs> and then I realized that our children, they deserve a pragmatic and optimistic relationship with technology. Because the current technology scene is built on the children of the 60s and 70s when the man went on the moon, when the personal computer revolution was happening in California, on a very optimistic and forward-looking era. And if our children grow up disillusioned, uh, frightened and scared about AI, machine learning and technology, they are not going to have a very nice future. And I think one of the important things you should tell to the kids is that there's already now so many different kind of human intelligence. Some of you are good at making friends, some of you remember song lyrics easily, some of you are really good at drawing three-dimensional rockets. And what machine learning and AI is, it's only a very, very narrow side of this intelligence. And there's no way the machine will be intelligent in all the different dimensions a human can be intelligent in. So we talk about strong AI and weak AI, and the advances that have been happening in machine learning recently have to do only with weak AI, which is really good, sometimes far better than humans, at solving specific problems, but nowhere near the general intelligence we humans have. And AI is an interesting word, because when we think about it, the definition changes as we change. If you showed a person in the 80s the mobile phone and said, I can get any answer to any question in the world from this phone only by asking a question via voice, they would think that's artificial intelligence. But nowadays, we don't think that's AI. We think that that is Google or that is voice recognition. And I think it's important to also teach the children that it's not only robots we talk about when we talk about AI. What AI is most powerfully doing is, is it, when it takes a lot of data about us and it packages that data into services like those of Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube. But more and more changes our very societies, the way we, in which we consume music, the way which we order food. And this is the true power of AI, not the Terminator robot. So how do you explain these things then? In order to get here, I think we need to first say that artificial intelligence is a fuzzy big word. We don't have a good definition for it. Then machine learning is one aspect of artificial intelligence that is actually really well defined. It's a technology. And within machine learning, we have things like deep learning and neural network, which are technologies that are making researchers really excited. And the only thing, again, that has been advancing recently is the machine learning side of things. Nothing with the general intelligence. And again, there's something about the way we speak that makes this very foreign. And I'm partly to blame. 
Because when we anthropomorphize things, when we say that a computer can see, can move, can communicate, can reason, and maybe even be creative, it makes us fearful. So maybe we should start saying that instead of seeing, we've given computer vision to the computer or image recognition skills. Maybe instead of saying that the computer speaks, we should talk about natural language processing and understanding. And it's a balance, of course, because we don't want to frighten people with these technical terms. But I think it's also really important to not make computers too much alike humans. So what is machine learning? Like in the example we heard before, programming is when you give step-by-step -step instructions to solve a problem. So, for instance, brushing your teeth by giving step-by-step -step instructions. What machine learning is, is solving a problem based on examples. So with my students, I first make them do the toothbrushing activity, and then I ask them to record themselves brushing their teeth and bring that example, that data point, to the classroom. And why machine learning is so exciting is because, first of all, we have a lot of computing power nowadays. We have specialized chips like the TPUs and the GPUs that are in charge of calculating things that were not possible in the 80s. And then we have a lot of data. And the word data is interesting because I can feel already part of you like glazing your eyes over a little bit and feeling like, oh, data. But data is really interesting because it's everything we do online. Every time you click something, every time you like something, every time you walk on the streets, you generate data. And that data means we can use it to teach computers. So when we wanted to teach the computer to learn to play Go, we would feed it uh, 100,000 examples of Go games online. And we want to teach a um, car to drive, we show it uh, images of, of real world um, traffic. When we want to recommend videos, we gather data about videos that you've liked before. And when we want to teach um, a toy to recognize your voice, we uh, collect a lot of different child's voices and different accents to teach it. And data is such an interesting thing because it proves that we can do things that we were not able to do in the past. So in the past, if we wanted to learn if this thing here is a cat, we would have written these very clear instructions saying that a cat is an animal with two ears, it comes in five colors, it has a tail, and these instructions would be really brittle, they would break down easily. And traditional programming wasn't very good at, for instance, image recognition for this reason. Now with the power of machine learning and data and computing power, what we can do is teach the machine by giving it examples. So instead of writing a definition, we give computers massive amounts of examples of cats. And then the computer builds a model of its own and comes up with rules of how to recognize a cat. So it might feel like this is something where we don't need humans at all, that the computer just develops and keeps learning on its own. But actually there's many phases in which humans are much needed in the AI and machine learning world. First of all, we need to ask the problems. Is this a cat? Second of all, we gather the data, we collect the examples of the cats. Then the computer builds a model and the computer gives an answer. But very importantly, actually the computer doesn't give an answer, it gives an estimation, a probability. And it's up to us humans to decide whether it's a question where we feel comfortable, a probability of 60 is okay. There are certain questions where it's okay, but some judicial, healthcare related things, we don't want the AI to be making rogue decisions on its own. So we need human intervenience and human uh, assessment. So we gather the data, the computer builds the model, gives an answer, and as the computer gets more and more examples, the model keeps on getting better. So these are kind of self-building systems. But still there's a lot of places where things might go wrong. And I often show kids these four pictures of cats and say, this is our training data, and we're trying to teach the computer to recognize a cat. What is the bias, the thing that might, the computer might misunderstand if it only learns the definition of a cat based on these pictures? Well, that a cat is always grey or black, that it has blue eyes. Okay, so now draw a picture of a cat that is stripy and uh, is maybe a hue of pink. What about here, if we want to teach the computer to recognize a teacup, uh, what is the bias it might learn? Well, probably it wouldn't recognize grandma's teacups with the, with the flowers, and it wouldn't recognize Japanese teacups that have no handles, and it probably wouldn't even recognize a teacup that has the handle on the other side of the cup. 
And these seem like innocent examples. But as we are automating more and more of our society with AI, it really makes a difference whether we accidentally build AIs that don't recognize nurses as only being women, uh, that think that Asian people and their squinty eyes don't have their eyes open when you make a camera that is supposed to recognize your face immediately, or that doesn't recognize black people's uh, like face, uh, face because it doesn't have enough training data. And this is the reason why we need so much more diversity immediately in the people who are building these machine learning systems. And we practice this with the children. Sometimes I ask them to choose an AI task they want to teach the computer, and they collect examples of data. Uh, here's first graders who've made cats. I really like the fact that one of them like cut out a little bit of fur from the, <laughs> the, the magazine. Here you can see we were trying to teach the computer to recognize uh, the letters and realize that already in one magazine you have so many different kinds of letter ends. And on the other side, we were trying to teach the computer to recognize as a happy person, and you can see the problem we have here in Scandinavia immediately. All of the people in the magazines were white, which is <laughs> pretty problematic. And this is one of my favorite ones. It's a girl who wanted to teach the computer to recognize a unicorn. And she was fiercely proud when she knew how to draw the unicorn from behind. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So I think it's important also here to remember that while AI is magical, it's not based on magic, it's based on logic and data. So again, it takes input, it processes that input somehow, and out comes the modified output. So for instance, when you have a self-driving car, it has input from car cameras, there's a process that maps the position of other cars, and the output is the ability to drive. And obviously self-driving cars have many, many more machine learning systems built inside of them, but the basic principle is still the same. And maybe schools should be teaching what's easy for humans, what's hard for humans, what's easy for computers and what's hard for computers, instead of building this dichotomy of two different classes. Maybe we should see the AI as a sidekick who's really awesome at things that we humans actually are not very good at. So for instance, for one of us, all knowing all the possible moves in chess is really easy, while the other one is really good at comforting others. One can calculate big numbers together, while the other one makes great pancakes. Pancakes require quite a lot of like, um, a problem, <laughs> like problem solving immediately, and uh, these motoric skills, and, and there's a mess to be made, so computers are not very good with dealing with those kinds of things. One of us can travel the space and time immediately and know what kind of weather it is in New York right now, based here in Trondheim. But the other one knows the eye color of their grandmother, uh, because we humans are really good at learning this kind of context. And probably what I want to end up with is that might be that the way we're teaching programming right now won't be relevant going 30 years forward. Again, it might be that our children will be collecting examples of toothbrushing instead of writing flowcharts or step-by-step -step, uh, instructions. But I think the attitude you learn as a young kid will remain with you. And I want to end up uh, with a few thoughts uh, from one of the pedagogical movements I feel mostly influenced by. And many of you probably know the tiny Italian village of Reggio Emilia, uh, which basically reinvented early childhood education for art, through art. And the reason why I'm bringing up this poem is because oftentimes as school people, you're so focused on making a plan or a strategy or having the perfect answers, being absolutely ready to go in front of your class. Uh, or your school district board. But the Italians, they didn't have a plan. They had a poem. And the poem famously states that the child has a hundred languages to express themselves. They have the language of laughing, of uh, sculpting, of singing. But often in school, we only say to them that you have the language of reading and writing. And we tell them that reality and fantasy, science and imagination don't belong together. But luckily, the child knows better. They do belong together. And Loris Malagotzi, if he lived today, would probably consider a computer science as one more language of the child. So it might be that one or, an, in one or another way, 
the way you teach these things will change. Uh, the plan is never perfect. There's many different ways and ideas to use these materials. Uh, Ruby, I think it at its best is a campfire and I'm showing you really rapidly a few examples from schools around the world in which they are reinterpreting the, the content, uh, taking it into their classroom in different ways, um, integrating it into existing things like B-bots or uh, actually building whole memory cards uh, or like apps around Ruby. Um, I think one of the most cute moments has been, this is a school from Bronx where the students dressed up as Ruby characters for their science fair and I love the empowerment of the little black boy who felt that he could be Ruby. <laughs> That's feminism for you. <laughs> And then on the other side, there's a classroom teacher who dressed up as Ruby herself. And it might be that the parents ask, what does this have to do with computer science? I think it has all to do with computer science. Because we learn through stories, we learn through memories. And making memorable and meaningful projects for the children will help them feel that technology is a field where they belong. Um, I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to wrap up really quickly. I think. The final message I want to send with you is that the plan is not really critical. The planning, the process of discussing, the gathering of people like this is what's critical in planning a computing curriculum for the next generation. And there's a lot of examples from abroad. I think really important is to recognize that our culture has really influenced the way we do education. I used to be really gung-ho about thinking that there's one app that should disrupt education. That's not true. Education is so tightly integrated into the way we think into the way we value the world, that there is no one solution to solving this thing. We need a multitude of different approaches. And even here within the Nordics, we have so very different ways of thinking about how and why computer science should be taught. And when you go a little bit abroad into UK, you see that they have a very different definition, again, of how and why computer science should be taught. And in New York, where I work quite a bit right now, um, they've stated, for instance, that computer science uh, by 2020, all children should have a meaningful experience of computer science at different age groups. And I think, again, a very interesting way of framing the problem. And I'm going to end up with a story, because this is one of my favorite stories and it outlines the challenge you're facing. A few months ago, I read in The Guardian an article about Oxford University, no, Cambridge University researchers who had done a test with children. And they had done this test where on the other side of the table they had pictures of natural things like animals and plants and, and trees, and on the other side they had pictures of Pokemon species. And they were showing these pictures to British children, and by far the children were better at recognizing the Pokemon. They had much more vocabulary to describe the Pikachu than the birch tree, much better at recognizing Bulbasaur than the badger. And the researchers were worried because what happens in a world where we don't have language to describe what is around us? What happens to democracy? What happens to the feeling that we can influence the world we live in? And I'm worried too. I, I want the seven different words of Scandinavian snow to stick in the Finnish vocabulary for a long time. But I'm also worried about the world of technology, where more and more we have these suitcase words, these words that pack so much into them. Words like the Bitcoin, the blockchain, the DDoS attack, the algorithm. And we just throw these suitcases from one person to another, never to unpack them. And that requires us to really think about how do we teach these things, and also us who work within the industry to update our ideas. So once a little girl came to me and said, Linda, is internet a place? And I say, oh no, internet is not a place. Internet is this interconnected group of computers. You can think of it as the global village, the cyberspace, the information superhighway. You can go surfing online. And then I realized that, oh sure, I sound like a kid of the 90s. This child has never disconnected. He has never pressed the modem button that does the near thing. The internet is something invisible that is everywhere around him, and I really need to start updating my metaphors. So is the internet 
the fiber optic cables that go from the bottom of the sea all the way to the space, or the server farms that store the data about us? Or is internet the data, the protocols that define how the data travels around the world eight or nine times in a second and really start to change the way we experience friendships and families and our societies? Or would internet be the cat videos, the funny memes and all of the bursts of creativity that happen when the six billion of us can finally talk to one another? And this is your challenge as educators. All of this is technology. You can't teach only the hardware, you can't only teach the software, and you can't only teach the societal impact technology is having. You need to teach all these things at the same time, and the darn things keep changing all the time. Okay, so final thing. I'm often asked, why a book? I think a book is a wonderful way to teach about technology because we understand what a book is. A book can give you wings, a book can be a party, a book can be a puzzle, and a book can be a campfire. And what I want to do with Ruby is build a campfire where children have and create memories they will remember for a long time into their adulthood. And another thing I'm often asked is, oh, but children have so much screen time already. We, they shouldn't be spending any more time in front of the computer, because the computer is the thing we easily blame. But you know, it's not a computer. It's a magic wand, it's a guitar, it's a telescope, it's a treasure finder, and anything the child can imagine. Technology, at its core, is built on humanity. The computers where humans were really, really good at calculating long series of numbers in the Victorian era England when there were no calculators out there. And in some way I believe that the very last computers in the world will be again human. And it's interesting to think about the word technology, because now we think about being technologically literate, we think about social media skills and e-skills and all of these coding things. But being technologically literate at the era of the combustion engine or the bicycle was a very different thing. And we don't know what the next technological thing will be. Today it's the computer, but tomorrow we don't know. So we need to rely on the definition by the creek, which says, states that Technology is the tools needed to do the job. But not only the tools, also the skills and competencies we humans bring into the problem-solving equation. Thus, the Greek believed that agriculture is a technology. Democracy is a technology. So I'm going to leave you with a definition of technology I was given by a nine-year-old little girl when I asked her and her classmates to define to me what is technology, what is it used for, and who uses technology. And this is what she came up with. She told me that technology is electricity that loves. <laughs> It is used to play. I use it to have a conversation with my mum. We use a WhatsApp application. And then finally, and most importantly, people use technology. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have, um, we have time for uh, a couple of questions. Um, I forgot to tell you that you could ask questions through the app. Um, and, and you can also ask questions in Norwegian, because I just learned that I have a superpower. I understand <laughs> quite a lot of Norwegian yeah. through the mandatory Swedish. So. But uh, hands in the air if you want a microphone. In the new Norwegian curriculum, artificial intelligence was first included, but since removed due to feedback from Norwegian teaching institutions. Mm. What would uh, Ruby think of this as she comes <laughs> up? Well, Ruby would think that it's really important for children to learn about probability and the math behind AI and machine learning, but it's also really, really important to talk about these philosophical concepts. And I do think that there's a trade you make. Of course, building a curriculum is a compromise in so many ways, and it could have been too taxing for the system to say that we're going to put AI and machine learning into the curriculum and take out something else, because it, it's, like all of you know, it's often a fight of who gets to say what. But 
but I would try to sneak it into the social sciences. I would talk about it in career counseling. I would try to sneak these aspects into many different areas uh, of, of the curriculum because that's where they belong. I don't think AI is one thing that should be taught. Um, like. Uh, we teach one hour of AI, that's done, the kids know about it, because it's again changing all the time. And as mentioned, you'll find online uh, some of these resources I'm showing to you. Um, HelloRuby.com slash NO uh, has a lot of Norwegian material out there, and we're going to update also them. AI stuff there, uh, so you can already start teaching these things. And curiously enough, a few years ago I was in China, I won this award, but my publisher told me that, oh, Chinese parents, like, they don't really recognize the value of coding and computational thinking, that it's going to take a while for us to educate them on this. And then a year ago, the Chinese government says that AI is strategically important for China, and that means all of the eighth graders in China need to learn the math needed to do some deep learning matrix calculations calculation stuff and so forth, and all of a sudden my publisher calls and says, Linda, uh, Chinese parents don't need convincing anymore. <laughs> so sometimes it of course is a great thing that the curriculum can change direction of a country really quickly, but as Nordic countries are not totalitarian, as they are not like, um, okay, I'm not <laughs> say that, but uh, as they are not um, uh, like, uh, as we have this long history of being able to discuss and build together, I think it's not a tragedy that the, the machine learning and AI stuff uh, was dropped out of the curriculum, but I do feel like it's something that you should revise uh, every now and then, think about at what point you want to maybe reintroduce it. Or maybe, maybe it's a part of like many different disciplines. Long answer, <laughs> sorry. Great. Any other questions? Hands in the air? I'm going to hang out here afterwards, so, so if you want cool. to come, rather talk to me privately, yeah, we can do Yeah, a lot that. of people are eager to get home after a long conference. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's been a hectic few days, but it was really great. I loved your talk. I especially loved the quote at the end. Mm. Technology is electricity that loves. That's Sweet. beautiful. Um, <gasps> these are mittens. I love that. Also quote. Sequences of instructions. Traditional where you kind of, of Nor well, it's a Norwegian pattern. It says sedbu mitten, oh, but with lovely. enkul. Beautiful. And they're handmade by Thank you. mother of one of my colleagues, actually. So, and chocolate. Thank, Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.